Hello, my name is Rachel. I am part of the Solar Switch team, and we are very excited to be offering you this Solar 101 webinar where you can learn all about solar installations. You will be hearing from our partner, Solar United Neighbors. Solar United Neighbors is a vendor neutral nonprofit organization that works throughout the US to help people go solar and fight for their energy rights. They are incredibly knowledgeable on solar and we are happy to be working with them to offer Solar Switch. They will walk you through the basics of solar technology and economics. At the end of their presentation, you will also be presented with information that is specific to where you live. Our program conducts reverse auctions with qualified solar installers, which result in discounted prices on high quality solar installations. If you choose to register for our program, then after the auction has taken place, there will be another series of webinars available to you. Those sessions will walk you through the Solar Switch personal recommendation page and the winning solar packages. Those webinars will include a presentation from your winning installer where you can learn more detailed information and more about the winning products. During the installer webinars, you can also speak directly to a Solar Switch representative as well as directly to the installer via chat. In addition to our webinars, you can access more information about solar panels and our program on our frequently asked questions section of our website. Without further ado, you will now hear from our partner, Solar United Neighbors. Hi, my name is Corey Ramston. I'm the VP for Go Solar Programs here at Solar United Neighbors, or SUN, and I'm here to cover some basics on solar technology and economics. This information will better prepare you to make a decision on how to go solar. At Sun, we're a vendor neutral 501c3 nonprofit that helps people go solar, join together and fight for their energy rights. We're a national organization with staff all over the country. In 11 states, DC and Puerto Rico, we also offer bulk purchasing programs like this. Since we got our start in 2007, we've helped thousands of people go solar. Our story began with something called the Mount Pleasant Solar Co-op in Washington, D.C. back in 2007. Walter, pictured on the left, is the son of our executive director, Anya Schoolman. He and his friend Diego wanted to go solar. Anya looked into it and quickly found out that going solar wasn't so easy at the time. Walter and Diego went door to door around the neighborhood and signed up 50 neighbors interested in working together to untangle the complicated process. After lots of meetings and research and coordination, 45 neighbors in that first group went solar. After that, Anya realized Anya started getting calls from people all over the country wanting to organize similar groups. Today, we focus on helping people go solar, joining together and fighting for their energy rights. Sometimes that means an educational webinar like this, or it could be a solar happy hour to celebrate a new batch of solar homeowners. And sometimes it means defending solar energy bill crediting policies or working to pass a state law to prevent homeowners associations from stopping solar or working with a city to make solar permitting uh, easier for everyone. Before we get into the presentation, I wanna take a moment to address the inequities in our current energy system. Low income and communities of color have the highest energy burdens. On average, low income households spend 7.2% of their income on utilities, while higher incomes spend only 2.3%. Communities of color, particularly the black community, bear an unfair share of the cost of energy production, but receive fewer benefits. Families of color are more often harmed by higher utility bills and shutoffs. On top of that, housing discrimination is a barrier to home ownership and thus solar ownership. Rooftop solar lets communities invest locally. It creates good local jobs and it brings control of the ener energy system within our reach. We're working hard here toward a new energy system that everyone can participate in, one that is fair and equitable and has rooftop solar as the cornerstone. So let's get to the main part of the presentation. In this webinar, we'll be covering not only the technology topics you need to, go, to be a good consumer, but also the economics and incentives of solar that make it such a great way to invest in your home and lower your electricity costs for the long term. Today, we're talking about photovol solar photovoltaic or solar PV technology. PV technology converts light energy into usable electricity. The majority of today's solar PV uh, solar market is PV technology. Solar thermal is another residential solar technology 
That would be for heating a pool or directly heating your homes, hot water, but it is a small percentage of today's solar market. So we'll be talking about strictly solar PV or solar photovoltaic technology here. A solar panel is constructed of silicon cells and is surrounded by layers on either side to protect it from the elements and make it rigid so it can be mounted securely. The silicon cells convert the sun's light into electricity. These panels are connected to the roof through a racking system. Racking comes in a variety of types that allow solar installers to connect the solar array to just about any building or ground location. One of the most common roofing types is asphalt shingle. But for this type of roof, attachments are made to the rafters of your home through the roof and then waterproofed to prevent leaks either through flashings, as seen in this photo. Specialized compression and sealant attachments are also an option. Those attachments provide the base for aluminum rails and then the panels are bolted on top of those rails. Here's another roofing type. This is a standing seam metal roof that shows the use of clamps to attach to the roof seams and then to the racking that sits on top of it. Fun fact, this is my roof. Uh, I live in Washington, DC, and this system has been on my roof since 2012, generating electricity to cover about 40% of my energy needs. So let's talk a little bit about what makes a good roof for solar. A solar array works best when it has direct sunlight hitting it. As you can see here, there are several factors that make a good roof for solar. Typically, a roof facing east, south, or west with minimal shade and enough space, usually at least 200 square feet, will be best for solar production. You also want to make sure your roof has enough life left on it so you don't have to pay someone a couple thousand dollars, usually, to come back and uninstall the solar array so a roofer can fix or replace your roof and then have a solar installer reinstall the solar afterwards. Generally speaking, your roof should, be, should have at least 10 to 15 years of life left on it if you're considering solar. If you have space and your local permitting rules allow it, putting solar on the ground is another great option. The panels can be pointed directly south and benefit from better airflow beneath them to maximize energy production. Ground mount systems cost a little more because of the additional materials and the need for trenching the wires underground back to your home. Not all solar installers offer ground mounts and they may not be part of this program, so be sure to ask your installer if you're interested in that option. Solar inverters are the brains of the solar array. They convert the electricity coming from the panels into a form that your house can use. They also allow you to see energy production from the solar array and how it performs over time because inverters report that information to an online monitoring app you can access. There are a few different kinds of inverters. String inverters on the left are a single unit that control many panels. Microinverters are smaller and get attached behind each panel to control it individually. And optimizers plus a string inverter are sort of a combination of the two. Your installer will recommend the type they feel is best for your home, depending on things like how much shade there is. Shade can greatly impact how much energy your system will produce. Microinverters and optimizers are often recommended when there is potential for intermittent shade. Your electric panel is where the output of your solar array will go. Your installer will run wires from your inverter equipment to your electric panel so that solar generated uh, energy can power some or all of the electric loads in your home. In some cases, your electric panel may need an upgrade to support solar, but this isn't common. Your installer can tell you whether you need one uh, once they take a closer look at your home. So let's put this all together. You can see here, we put all the components together in one solar array. The panels are on the roof. The wiring comes down into your inverter. Then the wiring goes into your main electric panel. From there, it powers loads in your home. And when you are making more than you need, that energy goes back out onto the grid to power other things nearby in your area. We'll discuss more about excess electricity production later in the webinar. Let's make sure you're on, we're on the same page with some terms we'll be using. First, a kilowatt is a measure of power capacity. That's the output rating of your solar panels and the solar array as a whole. A kilowatt hour, on the other hand, is energy and is what your array will produce over time. This is also what you pay for on your utility bill. Average systems can range from six or seven kilowatts, but sometimes might be as small as three or as big as 15 kilowatts or more. How big your system is will depend on several factors. One, how much space you have for solar. 
two, how much energy you use in a year, and three, your budget. We see lots of interest in batteries in our work. So let's talk about energy storage. Without batteries included, your solar array will not produce electricity when the utility grid is out. This is because inverters are designed not to send electricity back into the grid during an outage so that repair people can safely fix the lines. If you want power when the grid is down, you need to add batteries. This lets you store electricity, and then you can disconnect from the grid in an outage and run some or all of your house on the batteries. The batteries get recharged by the solar panels. Batteries can be expensive, so you need to consider how often the power goes out and what's important to keep running when it does. In most states, adding batteries right now is more about backup power when the grid is out. Due to the high cost of batteries, they are usually not going to make you money. That's starting to change in some places, though, where battery owners can get paid to help out the grid, but this is still relatively new. Here's a more concrete example of the kind of things you can run when the power is out if you have a battery. Depending on how much battery storage you can afford, you may have to choose how much you want to run on batteries during an outage. This family chose to only to run some of their loads with the solar array recharging their batteries. As you can see, some appliances like a dryer or an electric stove require more power and energy to run, so they chose not to include those. Okay, so let's switch gears a bit here and talk about solar crediting. What happens when you are producing more solar energy than you can use in your home at a given moment? The answer is those electrons flow back out onto the grid to power nearby electrical loads in your neighbor's home or maybe even the business down the street. Once those electrons leave your house and pass through your electric meter, you can get a credit for producing that electricity. This credit usually shows up on your electricity bill. How much of a credit depends on where you are and the rules in your area. Those rules can vary by state or even by utility. In some places, the credit value is the same for every kilowatt hour you send to the grid as the cost to you to buy that kilowatt hour. This is called full energy net metering. In other places, the credit value is less and can even fluctuate based on the time of day or the time of year. You can check with our team about the rules in your area, and you can also ask your installer. We'll also go over more specifics on the rules in your area later in the webinar. In the last part of this section, let's cover some common questions from people considering solar. First, warranties. Your solar array has several kinds of warranties. First, the panels and inverters both come with product warranties from the manufacturer. This covers product defects. They can range from 10 to 25 years, depending on the product. And, and for the inverters, you can usually pay a little extra to extend the warranty period. The panels also come with a production warranty. This warranty is the manufacturer's promise that the panels will continue to produce at a specific rate, which often declines very slowly over time. These warranties are usually 25 to 30 years. Last, you have a workmanship warranty from your installer. This warranty usually covers the work they do to install a system including roof penetrations. <clears throat> These warranties can range from two years all the way up to 20, depending on the installer. It's common for bulk purchase programs uh, with our installers in bulk purchasing programs to offer longer warranties due to the competitive bidding process. Homeowners insurance. When you install solar, there's typically no impact on your home insurance rates, but we have heard of some companies increasing rates and some decreasing them. It's best to call your insurance company ahead of time and let them know you're installing solar and ask them about any impact to your policy. Maintenance. Solar is a very low maintenance technology, but like anything else installed in your home, like an air conditioner or a furnace, you need to get it inspected periodically. <clears throat> we typically recommend having someone come take a look and do a visual inspection every three to five years. <clears throat> this is also a good time to get your panels cleaned if you live somewhere where dirt and dust tend to accumulate. Speaking of cleaning, if it rains periodically where you live, then it's usually not necessary to clean your panels. However, if you live in a very dry climate, you may want to wash your panels once a year to remove any buildup of pollen or dust. If you do clean your solar panels, we suggest using lukewarm water and no household cleaning products because they may damage the panels. You can also hire someone else to clean your panels. And please, if you can't reach your panels safely, call a professional to clean them instead. System lifespan. Solar arrays are built to last 20 to 25 years. They are an asset that reduces your cost of electricity for the long term. So it's important to keep them in good working order. Homeowners Association. 
If you live in an area with a homeowner's association, be sure to check with them when going solar to confirm the process for approval. Many HOAs are supportive of solar, but some aren't. It's best to know ahead of time to avoid any surprises. In many states, there are also laws that sit to say if or how much an HOA can restrict solar. Your installer may also be willing to help you through this process, and we have a guide available as well to help you navigate the process. And last, historic districts. If you live someplace in a historic preservation with historic preservation rules, be sure to ask your installer what additional steps may be required. Historic districts sometimes restrict whether your panels can be visible from street level. This may require the installer to make different design decisions to accommodate the rules, and there may be additional approval steps to get the permit. Moving on to solar economics. That covers all the tech topics we want to share, so let's switch now and talking about the economics of solar. As you can see from this chart, the cost of solar has dropped dramatically over the years. Gone are the days of solar being a boutique investment for the well-off. Because of solar price declines and various financing options, solar is available to a wider and wider cross-section of people. As that price has come down, the main area of, of cost for installers has changed. The main takeaway from this graphic here is that the biggest cost to installers these days are soft costs, or in other words, everything but the equipment and materials. That includes the cost of finding new customers like you. This is one of the reasons that bulk purchasing programs like this work. They reduce the cost to installers to find customers and you share that savings with them. One of the main drivers of the economics of solar is the federal tax credit. Available all over the country and thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, it's set at 30% of the system cost until 2032. This is a non-refundable credit, which means that it is directly reducing your tax liability. If there's any credit left over in one year, you can roll it over and take the rest of it in future years until it's used up. If you own your home, this credit is likely available to you. As always, with any tax issue, please consult your tax professional to make sure you understand whether this credit is applicable to your circumstances. To pay for solar, most people need some sort of financing. There are a lot of options available today. Loans are available through your installer, and you can also source those funds directly from your local bank or credit union, or even a home equity line of credit. In some states, third-party ownership is also available. In this arrangement, someone else owns the solar array and maintains it, and you just pay them monthly for either the use of the array, which is a lease, uh, or for each kilowatt hour the array generates, which is called a power purchase agreement, or PPA. Thanks for listening. We're mostly done, but there are some solar topics that are more specific to where you live, like how solar is credited and valued, state and local incentives, some local tech considerations, and local pricings for solar. We'll cover these topics next. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanner Simeon Cox, and I'm the Colorado Program Director here with Solar United Neighbors. I'm going to be talking about some locally specific information whenever it comes to going solar in the sort of greater Denver area. To get us started, we're going to take a look at net metering. So in this area, every kilowatt hour that you send back to the grid has the same value as a kilowatt hour you buy from the grid. That energy will go out and power things in your nearby area, and you'll get a credit you can use later to buy energy the next time you need it. The value of any energy you export to the grid does change depending on when you make it. This is called time of use pricing and is part of the electricity tariff rules for some solar homeowners in Excel territory. So here is sort of the general idea of what this could look like on your utility bill. The amount of solar you generated but didn't use will immediately get subtracted from the total amount you used from the grid. What's left is what you'll pay the utility or re retail provider depending on where you live. Now, if there are more solar credits generated than you need in one month, you'll have them as a credit for a future electric bill. So next we're gonna take a look at some other local considerations. Um, so when, when snow accumulates on the panels, they may have a reduced or no energy production while covered in the snow. The good news is that the snow will usually melt off the panels faster than the rest of the roof. In some situations, that does mean the snow may come off in a rush all at once because of the slick surface on the panels. 
If your solar is above a walkway or something of value, you may want to consider snow guards to protect against this big rush of snow uh, from coming off your panels. So you may also want to consider getting squirrel guards for your panels if you have critter activity in and around your roof. Squirrels can chew on the wires and do real damage to a solar array that can be expensive to repair. Both of these measures cost a little bit extra, but can be well worth it. So we recommend that you check with your installer on whether they think you need this equipment in your situation. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the interconnection delays we have been hearing about in Excel territory. In short, interconnection approval refers to the step in going solar where your utility company gives you permission to actually use your new solar array. When the utility is doing their review, they consider a number of things, from how much space or capacity the utility has available on your local grid, to making sure your system meets the necessary safety standards. For the past several months, Excel has been experiencing some delays in this process, ranging anywhere from six to eight months. While we are happy that we've seen some improvements in this process uh, as, as of late, I do want to highlight a few things for you to be aware of. First, uh, it's important that you make sure all design and system sizing details are finalized before you begin the interconnection approval process. Confirming these details may help prevent unnecessary secondary reviews. Second, coordinate with your installer to make sure all necessary interconnection paperwork has been submitted and approved before your installation actually begins. And finally, uh, we recommend that you ask your installer about any grid capacity issues Excel may be seeing in your neighborhood. While it's not a 100% guarantee that your installer has all of the information readily available, having this open discussion may help to avoid some future roadblocks. If you do follow all these steps and are still running into issues, uh, please do not hesitate to contact me and Solar United Neighbors uh, to talk more specifically about your case. So here we have some example pricing for the kinds of costs you can expect. The pricing is not specific to this group, but does include the savings that comes from the buying program and is close enough to help you get an idea of the costs, incentives, and savings. The system sizes are just sample sizes from the lower to the higher end. From the full system cost, you can subtract the value of the federal tax credit. You need to have the tax liability to use that credit since it is non-refundable. Or, in other words, your tax bill needs to be larger than the credit to use it. However, you can also take the credit in smaller chunks over several years until it is all used up. That money will come back to you when you file your taxes for the year the system was installed. Next, you can see the, um, the electricity savings. So this is the most important part of the economics of going solar. The savings represents a yearly reduction in your electricity bills for the life of the system. With solar, what you are doing is fixing a portion of your electricity costs far off into the future. When it comes to financing solar, as I mentioned earlier, loans are very common. The terms of loan of the loan can make a big difference in terms of your overall savings. There are short-term loans available and long-term loans available. With long-term loans, you're paying more interest, and with shorter loans, your payment will be higher, but you will pay less in interest overall. In some cases, the energy savings on your electricity bill can cover the monthly loan payment uh, amount. So now we are going to chat a little bit uh, about an alternative to rooftop solar, which is uh, community solar. So community or shared solar makes it possible for anyone with an electric bill to access solar energy, even if they can't put it where they live. With community solar, you can subscribe to energy from a community solar project. Every month, you receive a credit on your electricity bill for the energy produced. While this option is not available through this group, there are options available in the area. It is an important complement to rooftop solar because it can help those unable to go solar directly also directly access and benefit from solar in their community. It's also a critical way for low to moderate income residents to directly access and benefit from local solar power generation. 
that is all from me. I just want to thank you for your time and attention. Um, and if you do have any questions about what we've shared today, uh, we have our email here. So please feel free to reach out and ask. Thank you so much. And you all have a good one. All right, this brings us near to the end of our webinar. Just a few final comments. Remember to visit our website if you have any more questions. If you haven't already registered, you can visit our website today to sign up. It's completely free to participate and there's no obligation to accept an offer if you register. Lastly, a survey about our webinar will pop up on your screen. If you have a moment, we would greatly appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to improve our information sessions. That is everything. Thank you for attending. We hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, you can also contact our help desk at hello at solarswitch.com. Thank you and have a great day.